Today we are starting a new series. And just this last week in the office, one of our staff people asked Pastor Zach what the title of the series might be. And Zach answered, brace yourself and let me know when you're ready and I'll tell you. Here it is, the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> yeah. I confess that I'm a little upset that the title that I suggested was not even considered. It went like this, the wit and wisdom of the king enthroned at the axis of heaven and earth, a primer on new life in the kingdom. (laughs) Apparently that title was already taken, or maybe it was just too long and clumsy to fit on one of our beautiful slides. The Sermon on the Mount has been used and abused by all kinds of people almost from the moment it was delivered. A New York Times opinion piece lamented that, quote, among most Christians, you will find that most Christians ignore many of the things Jesus said in the sermon. He gave ample reasons to make that statement. I was convinced by his argument, and all I can say is, He's not wrong. Some evangelical Christians treat it like an extension of the Old Testament law, as if it were God's last-ditch effort to expose our sin and misery before finally expressing the gospel of grace. And so they take it as non-binding for Christians and do not take it to heart as something that Jesus wants his followers to observe. But ironically, outside of that, almost everyone, almost everyone, including most atheists, Muslims, and Hindus, hold the Sermon on the Mount in high regard. The vast majority of people who have ever read it say that it is noble, wise, and good. That doesn't mean that they observe the teaching. It only acknowledges that they appreciate what Jesus was trying to do in the sermon. And it is because of the Sermon on the Mount that many people consider Jesus to be at least a good man, if not a guru of some sort. And some people even venture to treat him as a life coach. The Sermon on the Mount has been called many things. A kingdom manifesto, a guide for revolutionaries, a manual for social justice activism, a sublime and benevolent code of morals, or even a handbook for radical disciples, not to be confused with handbooks for ordinary disciples, mind you. But if we want to avoid all of this sensationalism, we simply need to situate the sermon in its proper context. At the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus told his followers, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. How? by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and, and, a part we often forget, and by teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Observe all that I have commanded. So if we go back through Matthew's gospel, the first thing that Jesus commanded is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In other words, change your mind, change your life. And if you keep reading in Matthew's gospel, the next set of commands you find are in the Sermon on the Mount and so forth and so on. The point is that Jesus requires all disciples, all baptized Christians, all of his followers to observe, keep, practice, and guard his commandments, even the ones in the Sermon on the Mount. And as difficult and daunting as that might seem, I want to quickly remind you that he does not require any of you to go it alone. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, says Jesus. With all that in mind, let's turn our attention to the sermon of all sermons. And as we do that, I must tell you by way of confession that I am indebted to so many teachers for their insights and inspiration. I'm like a little child sitting on the shoulder of spiritual giants. And throughout my sermons in this series, I will be quoting and echoing them at times, 
but I don't want to bog you down with all the details and citations. If you want the sources, you may have all of my notes. I'm not trying to hide anything from you. I want you to know that I'm getting by with a little help from my friends. And I also want you to know that whatever I see, if I see anything at all, and whatever I show you, if I show you anything at all, it is only because I see what others have shown me. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what Christ the King says to his followers. In this story, we see disciples going up on a mountain with Jesus. The story echoes the story of Joshua and the elders going up on the mountain with Moses while the masses and the crowd stayed down below. And when the disciples left the crowd and drew near to Jesus, it probably seemed to some of them that Jesus was simply forming a special force of elite followers who were going to lord it over the masses. This is what worldly kings do, right? They get the cream of the crop, the strongest, the sexiest, the most skilled. But that's not what Jesus does. He brings his disciples up because he wants to teach them how he views the crowds who are following him. And he wants them to love and serve those crowds the way he does. He wants them to see in the crowds what he sees in the crowds. And so Jesus sits down and he opens his mouth and he speaks ex cathedra with inerrant and infallible authority. And he turns the world upside down with a few words. He declares the blessed cursed and the cursed blessed, the rich poor and the poor rich and the healthy sick and the sick healthy. The greatest is the least and the least is the greatest. The way up is down. These paradoxical truths help his disciples see things on earth from a perspective in heaven. And when Jesus said all of these things, he was not thinking of abstractions. He was not thinking of imaginary, hypothetical kind of people. He was thinking of the crowds of people who were just on the other side of his disciples. Crowds of people that had followed him from the valley of the suburbs of death to the vista of the mountain of life. The crowds that had followed him, who were the outcasts and the losers, the marginalized, the deplorables, and the rejects of their world. They were a community of misfits. And had Jesus gone to church planting school, he would have learned that these are not the kind of people you get together to form a core group for your church plant. In fact, you don't want very many of them at all because they're more costly. They can't give as much. But Jesus doesn't care about any of that. The story echoes the story of David in the Old Testament. Just as everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to David and David became commander over them, So now we see the same kind of people gathering to Jesus for the same kind of reasons. They were afflicted and tormented. They were troubled by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And when Jesus came into their corner of the world, he shone like a light. He rose up over the horizon like a sun dawning with healing in his wings. And he delivered them from darkness and distress. They gathered to Jesus from all over the country, and he became king over them. These crowds, with all of their weaknesses and all of their weirdness, were the people that Jesus had in mind when he sat on the mountain and opened his mouth and looked past his disciples to the crowds and said, Blessed! 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 The word blessed is descriptive. It means... Truly happy. Not happy because of their own emotional or physical condition. Not happy because of their life situation, but happy because they bask in the shalom of God. Happy because they live in the peace and prosperity of the Lord. Happy 
because they are comforted in the, in the promises and the power of Jesus. Jesus pronounces blessing over the souls that the world considers cursed. He pronounces true happiness over those who carry deep and immense sorrows. Truly happy are the spiritual zeros, the spiritually bankrupt, deprived, deficient, the spiritual beggars. This is how Dallas Willard put it in The Divine Conspiracy. Truly happy are those who claim nothing for themselves and are even so completely emptied of confidence in the flesh that all they can do is acknowledge their poverty. They have no spiritual power, experience, or knowledge in and of themselves to afford them comfort or security in this life. They might own many things, but nothing owns them. They are detached. They are detached from the world and its things. They hold everything in an open hand and they live and they act as if all of those things could be taken away from them in an instant, either today or tomorrow. Charles Gore says that amidst all the supposed necessaries of life and the things we feel that we must have and cannot do without, the poor in spirit feel but one true need, and that is their need for God. Truly happy are the women and the men of constant sorrow. They lament over the conditions of the world. They grieve over the sin that's out there, and they grieve over the sin that's in here. As Dallas Willard put it, the weeping ones, whose mates have just deserted them, leaving them paralyzed by rejection, apparent in gut-wrenching grief and depression over the death of a child, or a pastor losing his wife unexpectedly. Children coming home to a motherless house. It could be a diagnosis, a loss of a job, the end of a career, dreams shattered and dashed. Whatever it is that drives you to become a sorrow bearer, as someone who feels the chill of winter in your soul as you walk under a cloud of grief in this veil of tears. Truly happy are those who mourn. They feel godly sorrow that leads to a change of heart in life. Truly happy are the souls who are based, based and unabashed. They're not prideful. They're not easily provoked by criticisms or intimidated by threats. Their strength is under control. Their potential is harnessed by the Holy Spirit. They're not forceful and pushy, but gentle and lowly. They don't insist on getting their own way. They don't exercise all of their rights. They don't feel the need to always get attention or say everything they know or share every opinion they have. They are content to stay in their own lane, out of everyone's view, minding their own affairs. Truly happy are those who crave justice and just want to see the world put back to right. It may be that the wrong is in themselves. Perhaps they failed so badly that night and day they cringe before their own sin and inwardly scream to be made pure. Or it may be that they have been severely wrong, suffered some terrible justice, and they are simply consumed with longing to see that injury set right. But more than all of that, they have an insatiable and unquenchable desire to be right with God. To be right with God. They want His righteousness, not their wickedness, to shape their life and to satisfy their hearts as nothing else can. They want the world to be right, but they want to be right with God before the world is right. Truly happy are folks who elevate grace above wrath, who hold back the fire that others deserve and hold forth the water that they do not deserve. 
For them, showing mercy is about more than feeling some emotional pity just because they are stirred by the sights and sounds of some human misfortune. No, their mercy and their pity leads them to practical action. Because they don't just feel sorry for people. They want to remove the, mystery, the misery that is weighing them down and crushing them. And if their mercy and pity does not lead to practical action, then it's simply like faith without works. It is dead. Bonhoeffer put it like this when he said, The ones who show mercy to others have an irresistible love for the downtrodden, the sick, the wretched, the wronged, the outcast, and all who are tortured with anxiety. They go out and seek all who are enmeshed in the toils of sin and guilt, and they try to help and comfort them. They're merciful. Truly happy are the souls who single-mindedly seek one thing. Their eyes do not drift around because their hearts are anchored deep. Their eyes are not full of adultery because their hearts are full of faithfulness. They are centered and focused on cultivating the holy life. As Calvin said, they take no delight in cunning and craftiness, but converse sincerely with men and express nothing by word or by look which they do not feel in their heart. In other words, they demonstrate on the outside what they desire on the inside. They don't treat others with mixed motives or hypocritical hearts. They don't prey on others with lust. They pray for others in love. Truly happy are people who are always in the middle of dangerous situations. The ones who stand in the gap and risk getting caught in the crossfire. Those who not only seek peace and avoid quarrels, but also labor to settle differences among others. And who advise others to live at peace and to take every occasion of hatred and strife and turn it into love and peace. They work to mend divisions, not maintain denominations. Truly happy disciples are often abused and troubled. Attacked and tormented in ways which they do not deserve. They are tested by fiery trials and suffer not as murderers or thieves or evildoers or meddlers, but merely as followers of Jesus. They're in trouble because they follow Jesus. They're insulted because they wear the name of Christ. They're persecuted because they walk in his steps. And yet somehow they, as Max Lucado put it, manage to keep an eye on heaven while walking through hell on earth. How do they become so truly happy? How do they become so truly blessed? And why are they truly happy? The answer is this. They are truly blessed because of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're truly blessed not only because of who they are or what they do. They are truly blessed because of who Jesus is and what Jesus promises to do in them and for them. They're truly happy because Jesus rewards them. He rewards you. He rewards you with the kingdom of heaven, with comfort. He rewards you with the new heavens and new earth. He rewards you with satisfaction for your heart and soul. He rewards you with mercy and shows you God's face he rewards you by making you the sons and daughters of God. He rewards you as reigning and ruling your life as your king. How do you become a truly happy person? You become a truly happy person by imitating the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who follow Jesus are truly happy simply because they're in communion with the king and they're being conformed to his image little by little, day by day. One catechism puts it this way. The Beatitudes depict the countenance of Christ Jesus and they portray his charity. They're the paradoxical promises that sustain hope in the midst of tribulations. 
They proclaim the blessings and the rewards already secured by Christ for his followers. The Beatitudes describe the countenance and the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another way to put it is this. If you have seen the Beatitudes, you have seen Jesus. Because Jesus is the Beatitudes incarnate. Jesus is true happiness in the flesh. And this is what it looks like as you walk through the Beatitudes once again. Think of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, who became poor in the eyes of the world in order to make us rich in faith. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped in a tight fist, and so he opened his hand and he emptied it all out. God became man, the king became a peasant, the peasant became a slave, and the slave died a humiliating and excruciating death on the cross. Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He lamented over the conditions of the world. He cried when he rode into Jerusalem on a colt. And when he stood at the graveside of a friend, Jesus wept. Jesus mourned in order to comfort those who mourn. He wept in order to wipe every tear from our eyes, in order to collect all of our tears in his bottle. As a memorial of our pain and our grief, Jesus was meek and lowly in heart. He submitted to men who had no authority over him. When he was reviled, he did not revile. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He committed himself to him that judges righteously again and again. He surrendered all of his rights even when he was wronged. He could have called thousands upon thousands of angels to deliver him and to destroy his enemies, but he did not exercise his rights. He did not go with that option. He laid down his life in order to give rest for our souls. Jesus craved righteousness. He craved righteousness so much that he opted to die rather than sin, and that is what he did. There was nothing, and I mean nothing, on earth that could ever satisfy Jesus like anything in heaven. He lived and died with hunger and thirst for righteousness so that sinners like us might be filled and satisfied with his righteousness. Jesus desired mercy, not sacrifice. He had compassion on the helpless and the harassed. He showed mercy to those who least expected it and least deserved it. He was made like his people in every respect. Yes, he was made lowly and outcast and poor. He was broken. He was ruined. He was cast aside so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in order to sympathize with you, to feel what you feel, to understand what you're going through, to walk in your steps, even as he calls you to walk in his Why? So that he would sympathize with your weaknesses, even your weirdness, and sacrifice himself for your sake. Jesus was pure in heart. He committed no sin, and yet he became a sin bearer in order to sprinkle our hearts clean and wash our bodies with pure water so that we might draw near to God and behold God's glorious face to give us the right to stand in face-to-face communion with God. He lived a pure and holy life. And Jesus entered the fray. He walked into a hostile world and volatile situations. He stood in the crossfire between God and man, and he took all of that hostility upon himself in order to put an end to it. He absorbed the shock of violence in his shattered body and he absolved our sins with his shed blood and thus he himself became our peace. The peace between us and God. The peace between you and me. The peace that gives us peace so that we might make peace. And Jesus was handed over to religious leaders and political rulers to be mocked and falsely accused and condemned to death 
He was stripped and beaten and flogged. He was crucified, mocked and shamed in order that the afflicted, the oppressed and the persecuted of the world might be spared and might take possession of the kingdom that he promises them. Brothers and sisters, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Beatitudes in the flesh. And if you've seen the Beatitudes, you have seen God walking among you. I want you to remember, if you forget everything else, what Jesus says to you, that your true happiness is bound up in him. That true happiness is promised to all who follow him. And that all those who follow Jesus are truly happy simply because they are in communion with the king and they are being conformed to his image as they live out life in his kingdom. And with that in mind, we can go on our way rejoicing and being glad, knowing that great is our reward in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made. And you forgive the sins of all of those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we who lament our sins and acknowledge our weakness may obtain from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness of our sins. And as it is difficult for us in our flesh to see how we who are so lowly and we who are so weak and we who are so sinful and we who are so misguided and unclean could be considered truly happy in the eyes of the Lord Jesus, Grant us the grace to repent and to see ourselves as he sees us. Grant us the grace to sit at his feet and bask in the shalom of the Lord, that the peace and the promises of God may descend upon us and deliver us from evil, that we may delight in the presence of the Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.